So in case there's any confusion, Larry Goldberg has not had work done. <laughs> <laughs> Bradford couldn't join us last night and Larry Goldberg couldn't join tonight. So I just uh, made some calls and uh, we've got uh, Bradford tonight and Larry Goldberg on Saturday morning. So what the heck? Uh, we're Glad it worked out. <laughs> Sorry right. about that. That's all good. It's all good. Whatever works, works. So uh, Bradford, uh, you have now had another week since we've last spoken of driving around that monster truck and also driving around on FSD. What level you got now? I'm 12.3.3. I got 0.3. Okay. I'm waiting to talk to some folks with 0.4 because it seems like that is a step change, apparently uh, significantly better. And we actually drove around on our 3.3 last night and had a pretty significant problem. Mm -hmm. We were driving in an area where we had uh, a very large center divider between two uh, one-way streets, large enough that one or more cars can if they want to make a left or right turn to, you know, at a, at a, a vertical, I mean, a uh, perpendicular street, that car gets in there and has to stop again before it proceeds over to the street mm -hmm. going on. Well, boy, when we, and we were going along the main boulevard and every time we would get to one of those cross streets with cars coming in all those different directions, the, 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 the car was having, could not, could not get itself together and, and go without me hitting the, the accelerator. So that was it, uh, so it got very cautious and was slowing down. It was letting every car that was coming every other way go first. Yeah. <laughs> too considerate. Too considerate. Too considerate. Too nice. Yes. Too... <laughs> so anyway, Tesla anyway. wants to get regulatory approval by being super nice. It's, I call it Maui rules. <laughs> I don't know if you I don't know if you know Maui rules, but in Maui, it's like, no, you go, no, you go. It's like <laughs> so. Uh, well, so I, I showed it to a client on Friday okay. and what happened was it, it pulled out in a, in a, uh, in a roundabout when it shouldn't have. So okay. it ha I had a critical disengagement, but did drive them to their house and back. And, uh, it did have that critical disengagement, but right. you know, otherwise did good. Okay. So it is improved on 11, but um my disengagement did prevent an accident yes yes okay <laughs> yes, right. yeah that's those are the kind of disengagements we don't want to see anymore if we're gonna go all the way to robo but it it's so good i i enjoy driving it even though it makes some of those mistakes uh -huh. i know when to pay extra attention uh intersections and whenever it's pulling out right that's when you need to pay extra attention then Sure. Uh, so I enjoy it, and then each new version that comes out, I'm I'm looking for some key things like, you know, like that. So we'll see how it goes from here. All right. And your cyber truck? Are you still having a blast driving that around? Or anything that you've noticed new in a week that uh, is worth reporting? We did a little vacation, but what I can tell you is, in two weeks, I've gotten three software updates on the cyber truck. One of them added auto wipers um, okay. and I'm one was like supposedly some kind of game update, which I'm, I'm not sure what games are available <laughs> on that. Um, yeah, it just uh, continues to garner really good attention. I'm looking at getting mine wrapped potentially. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, we, we got like a really good deal to potentially get it wrapped in our area. So if we do that, um, may talk about that um yeah i'd say you know we, we will talk about fsd at 99 dollars a month that, that is what we're gonna big. talk about that is definitely <laughs> what we're gonna talk about because then there's a little mega pack we'll be talking about today and we'll talk about mega pack later so let's let's jump on to fsd at 99 dollars uh, I just put up a video this morning say, you know, will it go to $99? And with about two hours after I put that up, all of a sudden, oh, it's now $99. By the way, did you know it's $99 Canadian in Canada? Yeah, they're There's getting a sweet deal. bucks up there. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, in no particular order, I put these down. And, I, you know, if you want to take a different order, you can. But 
I was wondering some of the things that people are not talking about. I've been on a couple, I was on one spaces for a while talking about this and uh, a lot of stuff's being talked about, but what about the impact on new car sales? Do you think people that have been thinking about it where the, it, it was $2 a month, $200 a month. Now that it's a hundred dollars a month, that this could be the very thing that would usher them in to uh, making a purchase. I don't, I don't think it'll, I mean, if you can transfer your FSD to a, a new car, you know, that that's one thing. And, and you have that for the rest of this quarter. And, you know, we're curious if Tesla's going to go ahead and make that perpetual. Right. Um, on the order page, it doesn't talk about the subscription. Okay. Mm -hmm. At least I don't think it does. So you have the option to buy FSD for $12,000 on the vehicle. But it doesn't say anything about ninety nine dollars a month or one hundred ninety nine dollars a month. Uh, I think Tesla may want to switch, consider switch adding, switching that around. Yeah, yeah. So people know about that option. Um, I I don't think it will necessarily impact new car sales. Um, well, but I, I I would say it it will get FSD in more people's hands. Since people are paying a hundred bucks a month, they'll be more motivated to use it on a regular basis, and that'll get them talking about it yeah. again to their their family, friends, neighbors, and coworkers. I I think you know version eleven was to the point where um, it was good in California. I'm not sure outside of that, and I I think people weren't really using it mm -hmm. as much. Um, sure. They weren't. Uh, necessarily showing it off to people they know true and so i think with this new lower rate you have the chance to really reignite your your fan base and the people who really love tesla products yeah i was i was kind of thinking like for instance on the showing it to your neighbor part i think you just mm -hmm. did that in fact the other day um, when you're showing it off and then they say well that's pretty cool and you say well it's 200 dollars a month you know, our $12,000, they might go, whoa, that's a lot. But also uh -huh. for most people, if you're only talking 99 bucks a month, that starts to sound like, oh, that's just, you know, I I, I can take one less dinner out per month at current mm -hmm. rates in the restaurant. You can't get out for under a hundred bucks. So it's just one dinner out. Yep. Or just, you know, escape from dealing with rush hour traffic. You know, yeah. for a lot of people, it's a huge pain point. Yeah. Um, there's there's surveys people have done where you talk about do you want to drive or do you have to drive, need to drive. Yeah. Most people say they drive because they have to. Okay. So I, I think there is a market for just this product as a driver assist. And um, uh, you know, we'll we'll see where things go from here. But I, I think this could really uh reignite uh the Tesla fan base. One of the big things that was being talked on the spaces that I was on was about the impact on miles driven. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so people that have been not driving all the time on uh, on uh, the FSD are people that aren't driving on it at all. Um, people that uh, may turn it on now that didn't turn it on before. I mean, all these different things that are happening, it's going to be potentially a big increase in the data. Yeah, the, the, there was a, a maybe about 20, I, I did a poll is around like 25% were using FSD for like every drive. Okay. Um, there was some percentage where combined they add up to about 40% where people were using it for, for most drives. Um, but you know, that leaves 60% that weren't really using it. But also if you look at Tesla's own statistics where... 500,000 supposedly had FSD and they had only racked up uh, 650 million miles, mm. then that only means that the the average car for that whole time had had done about, or even for last year had done 1300 miles. Yeah. And, and that's not good because most Americans drive 14,000 miles a year. Right. And the average Tesla driver drives like nearly 20,000 miles a year. Oh, okay. So um, 
FSD usage was really low, in my opinion. So this would step it up. Um, it, yeah, the the improvement in in version twelve mm -hmm. steps it up big time. Um, so I I think there are a lot of people who weren't using it or were barely using it are going to be using it all the time. I I think it's delightful now. <laughs> I think it's enjoyable. Uh -huh. Um, so I, I use it when I'm not driving the cyber truck around because the cyber truck doesn't have it yet, but it will. Um, but then there's all the people that are getting a free trial and then seeing they can get it at 99 a month and, um, you know, th they're going to start using it. So Tesla is going to be getting, um, even more data, um, from this, uh, they could collect data in shadow mode, but they get more. Uh, when people are on FSD and sure. doing disengagements or doing your voice notes or whatever. Yeah. In fact, I'm wondering, uh, because, uh, you know, we had this huge, uh, you know, milestone of hitting the mil the 1 billion mile mark. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, Sawyer Merritt and others have been talking about hitting another billion within like six or seven weeks. Um, I have, I, I, I'm, I'm surmising in my head that when uh, these rides were being given to the new car owners and these customer service people were, you know, spending 20 minutes or whatever it was with the customer, showing them how to use, you know, the full self-driving and then mm -hmm. telling them that they could keep using it if it was $200 a month, they might have gotten some feedback from these guys <laughs> in terms of saying, oh, well, I no, $200 a month, I don't know, maybe not. Uh. And then they might have asked those customer service people say, well, would it make a difference if it was a hundred dollars a month? And you know, you start getting that kind of data. That's the kind of data that I love as a yeah. as an entrepreneur. I love that kind of data. Um, and so this would be uh, maybe Elon might have already calculated. Okay, we think we can get this more much more take rate based on the new FSDs. We can get this much more uh, take rate based on giving them a free trial. We can get this much more take rate based on dropping it to $99 a month. Maybe he's thinking they hit 6 billion miles before that April, that uh, August 8th date. That's certainly possible. They would need to, the miles would need to keep going strong after initial excitement. I, I think they should, you know, if you're paying per month to use something, it's like the gym membership. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a lot of pressure to, to make use of it. Sure. And I, I just think it's really good. I, I know some people still think they're they're better drivers, you know, in their areas. But when you take it to a new area, I think that's when your your eyes are really open where it's an area you're unfamiliar with and you see how well the car drives in that area. Yeah. So all in all, do you think this will have an impact on the stock price? This just this dropped to 99. In the after hours, it went up like a buck and a half when the mm -hmm. announcement was made, but then it kind of just faded off to being only up a half a buck or whatever. I haven't looked at it recently, but do you think uh, on Monday morning, I mean, again, this was a Friday night announcement. <laughs> are we going to see a, 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 some uptick on Monday morning, all things being equal? So last week we had a similar thing happen with the robo taxi event announcement by Elon on eight eight. He did it Friday after hours of, of last week, and immediately like the stock was up like four or five percent that after hours. Um, so I this may signal where things may head next Monday. Um, we'll, we'll see you know, what people think over the weekend, but I think bulls are very excited by it. Um, yes. guys in spaces talking about it on, on X and, um, I'm pretty excited about it. You know, to me, this means, I think this means Tesla wants to get more data. Um, it also means, you know, they want to get tongues wagging about Tesla again. Um, so I, I think this is, a this is pretty good news. I don't see how um, people will get negative about it. I, I'd say like the one negative interpretation is, well, Tesla then has to sell twice as many subscriptions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But 
Um, I I think they're going to sell more than twice as many subscriptions. They may sell more than twice as many, and they might also decide, uh, you know, three months from now that uh, they were only selling 1.75 times as many, and that's good enough because of the data. Or mm -hmm. they decide that they need to drop the, you know, raise the price back up to 125 a month. Who knows? You know, there's all mm -hmm. kinds, of, all kinds of possibilities here. So, um, I, and it's gonna it's gonna be interesting to see what Tesla does with the one time payment. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I think if if they're feeling good about Robo Taxi, I don't think they're incentivized to um, continue to push or allow people to buy it on a one-time basis where oh. you get it for the life of the vehicle. Oh, I see. Yeah. I don't think they're as incentivized to do that if, if they figured it out. I see. Yeah. I can see your point. That's a good, that's a good point. Haven't heard that one before. That's, that's, that's good. So I was also thinking there might be an impact on the used car prices. Um, and one of the reasons I think there might be an impact on the used car prices is because if I was five years younger or even younger than that, but at this age, I'm not ready to start building new empires. Um, if I was five years younger or more, I would be buying up used Teslas with FSD right now. I'd be, I'd be hitting up everybody that's out there that wants to go look for them for me. Well, I may not want 20 or 30 or 40, but you know, you could probably make a really good living with 10. And, uh, you know, between now and when RoboTaxi happens for the entire fleet, you just put them up on Turo and you can make very good return on Turo uh, on Teslas. So, um, yeah, I'm, this is not investment advice, but uh, for those of you out there who are young enough to still go out and do something like that, um, that's something I think would be a heck of a business plan. Yes, it certainly has its own headaches, you know, dealing with renters, communication, uh, you know, getting your wheels uh, curb rash, you know, renting them out on Turo, all that stuff. There's certainly headaches like that. But if, if you think about um, a scenario where these cars do become robo taxis and they become that valuable, um, this is not investment advice or career advice, but <laughs> there's potential that the used Tesla could outperform the stock over some intermediate time frame where maybe the company doesn't get as much credit, um, but the the product is you know becomes much more valuable. Yeah, well, um, you could yeah you could see the vehicle itself becoming more valuable in addition. So you've got the income while you're doing it and the vehicle becoming more valuable uh, in terms of it's a business now. I mean, you could, you sell it, you can sell the, your five cars, your 10 cars as a, as a business, which has a, a, a knowable, a fairly, a fairly reasonably knowable uh, expectation of profits over, over a time period. So, yeah, I think, I think it would be a heck of a, and it's exactly up my alley. I did have two of my cars out on Turo. Um, over the years. And yes, it's a pain in the rear to pick people up and drop them off and all that kind of stuff. But I I got to the point where I was renting them out a week at a time instead of, uh, you know, only two or three days and was able to keep my cars rented pretty much all the time at yeah. a, minimum, a minimum week. Reduces the hassle by a lot. With Teslas, you don't need to worry about oil change or, <laughs> you know, brake pad changing. Essentially, it's um, like tires and wiper fluid. So you, the tires can wear out a little more because they're heavier and yep. they're a higher performance tire as well. Yep. Um, but like the the, the other thing is like uh, the transmission and engine of a of a gas car versus a, a battery electric vehicle where you have to deal with replacing the battery around 300,000 miles or so. Right. Um, so if you buy used Tesla at forty thousand miles, um, for maybe twenty five grand or whatever, then then that's a heck of a deal. Especially if it's got FSD on it, you know, maybe it's thirty grand or something like that. But um, actually, I, I saw one of the spaces I was on. The guy was talking. A guy with, knew knew the used car market. I guess he buys and sells cars, and and he said that right now the used FSD is around three grand. Mm -hmm. So you're paying about three grand for the used FSD. So and what, one thing he helps people do is buy the used and then um, 
and then immediately sell it. Uh, well, immediately use it to transfer the FSD to a new Tesla. <laughs> and then the person sells the the used Tesla not to like a CarMax or something like that. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, so um, I the other thing that I've been thinking a lot about, and I was curious to get your take on this, is that um, uh, well, in fact, uh, there's two stories. So one of them was on that same spaces. You might, I, were you on that spaces? You, I, I thought I might've heard Maybe, you. Maybe. Yeah. I might've heard you on that same spaces. And so one of the things that came up with is on the whole business of how safe does the vehicle need to be before it can become a robo taxi. And yeah. they, they made a really, really good point. I thought is that if we do few, if the robo taxi, if the Tesla vehicle does fewer accidents, fewer injuries, fewer deaths, and that is ascertainable and it's significant. I would think even if it was 25% less, you would think that you would have every city and every state saying, sure, absolutely. I mean, even with something like a, uh, a even when they first came out with the, uh, uh, the, the safety belts, um, there were people that were afraid of them because they said, what if I get trapped in my car? You know, I, I can't get, I can't get to the unlatch, you know, and then we've got, uh, airbags that go off and, and hurt people, hurt little babies. You know, we had to find uh -huh. new ways to not have them explode as completely anyway. So you're always going to have some amount of negative aspect, uh, to any safety device that you create. There's, there, there's no perfect solutions. So wouldn't it be just a matter of deciding how much better they need to be on those stats? And that should be good enough. Yeah, I'd say so. You know, pol policymakers that are um, clear, clear minded and open minded, I think, would be open to doing that. Uh, there is going to be a lot of pushback from unions um, already. Kentucky banned um autonomous driving or robo taxis and this was over the last week or so so like now that tesla has this version it's much better suddenly people are pushing through legislation to try and just ban it outright yeah, yeah. um right now public sentiment is pretty low about autonomous driving and supposedly like 80 percent of people have some kind of opposition or fear about it uh i didn't I didn't see the study specifically. I wish I could quote the exact verbiage, but um, though there's there will be pushback. But when when you could show with data how much safer it is, I think that's gonna that's a really big deal. Yeah, and Tesla's it's a, gonna get that data much faster. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, so one of the other thoughts that I had was, and, and I mentioned this I think on one of my shows earlier, but I'm curious to get your take on it. It seems to me like we need some kind of what does Cadillac call their system where you can call if you're in an accident and talk? OnStar. Yeah, OnStar. It would seem like Tesla needs to have an OnStar system on these robo taxis, uh, so that whatever the if the vehicle gets to a place when you know when there's no steering wheel, okay, mm -hmm. no. You know, and you are now stuck for some reason, whatever reason, doesn't matter. It could be a, a yeah. riot, could be, a, you know, people just start storming the streets or something. But you've got somebody to talk to uh, about what to do. A flat tire. I mean, that would be a, a great example. You know, what do I do? Do I just get out of the car and walk away, leave it in the middle of the street? Or what do I do? So having um, uh, an OnStar kind of system uh, to deal with some of these issues. Now, it could be, uh, it could be a human voice. It could be, yes. <laughs> well they have the app for that oh, they already have so, okay. so i i think you want to build that into the app the functionality of the app so is it on the app as opposed to the screen yeah okay where um i i think it'd be good in the software of the car too if that they can do that um tesla's already have the um the cellular connection or the cellular data right um so you know Probably there's a way to do that, but you could also just do it through the app and they would know which car you're in. Right. Yeah. So anyway, I think that would solve a lot of the problems that people have in terms of, you know, we've seen what's happened with some of these other uh, 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 Robotax or you know other kinds of brands where mm. they uh, got stuck with emergency situations uh, and then got <laughs> there with like blocking traffic and stuff. 
So I think if there was a quick way to uh, correspond, that would be good. So yeah, there's a couple of solutions right there. Well, data, data, data is what it's all about. And so uh, what e Elon is doing right now is generating a ton of data. And he says he is not compute restrained. So it would seem like this would be the strategically wisest possible way to proceed. Um, if it all works out, um, we might be finally getting to the chat GPT moment. Tesla is hoovering up tons of data. There are people who track with their Wi-Fi how much their Tesla is uploading um, up into the cloud. And it's it's over 100 gigabytes over the last month. You know, some do it, do that in a week. It's they're they're grabbing more and more data. They weren't like collecting every moment of every mile before, um, but they are sending more data back. Wow. Um, I think it's very encouraging that they're they're grabbing all this and they can set different triggers with data where they can collect like when the car is uncertain or to to find weird examples of things and so I don't know why, but when people post about their Tesla <laughs> uploading data, the posts really don't get much traction. Um, but I, I think it's a really big deal that yep. Tesla is getting this data. They're um, they're getting paid to get the data. So um, and the, their customers are sending them the data for free, you know, over their own customers uh, Wi-Fi. Yeah. And that's this is agreed to. So <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good deal all the all the way around. <laughs> yeah. All and right. this is this is uh, something that Waymo doesn't have. Um you know, right. Waymo or any of them. Yeah. Waymo is paying for engineers. It's uh, much more expensive. Um they're they're paying for the cars. Yeah. Tesla is selling the cars. The customers right. are paying them for the cars. Right. Yeah, no, it's a, it's definitely a very cool deal. We just have to watch now to see when we really get that moment that uh, or that that uh, that uh, uh, iPhone app moment. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. the street gets the fact that it's all about the app, not about the hardware. Yeah. Um. So from FX Street, we'll change gears here a little bit. Uh, oh, gears, we don't have those anymore. <laughs> from from FX Street today. It says consumer confidence in the U.S. weakened in early April with the University of Michigan's Consumer Sentiment Index edging lower to 77.9 from 79.4 in March. This reading came in below the market's expectation of 79. So the market was expecting a little bit of a decrease, but man, it was a pretty significant decrease. It says the current conditions index declined to 79.3 from 82.5 and the consumer expectations index fell to 77 from 77, whoops, I can't quite see what I wrote there, uh, from 77.4. All right, that was not as much of a, of a drop. And the details of the survey revealed that the one-year inflation outlook climbed to 3.1 from 2.9 in April, while the five-year inflation outlook rose to three from 2.8. So earlier today, Larry Summers said that the cost of borrowing is not in the inflation numbers anymore. It used to be, but it's not anymore. And this is why we have a disconnect between what the CPI is showing and what consumers' expectations are, because they are paying more for interest, and it's hurting them, and they're noticing it, and it's and they can't get the house, they can't buy the car. This is impacting their lives. What do you think? Yeah, uh, interest rates have come back up. I, I know when you and I were getting excited when the 10-year was coming down and a lot of rates are based off of that. Your your mortgage rate is based off the 10-year. Um, the auto loan rate can be a little more short-term. Mm -hmm. It kind of blends things. But like the two-year is still higher than the 10, right? Right, a lot. <laughs> so um, over, 100, over you know, 100 basis points. All these lending rates are based off these high rates, and that's what people are paying for their home. Uh, a lot of cars are financed or leased. And so that's your two biggest spending items are your home and your car. Right. Yeah, so this uh, would, would tell me that if consumers start to become less confident, when consumers become less confident, they may start putting their hands in their pockets. We've seen that, of course, there's not a lot of houses changing hands, as we talked about over and over again. No, no inventory, no reason for a granny to sell. 
uh, because she doesn't want to uh, move into a house with a higher rate than she's got now. And nobody's building houses. So we got all those things hurting the housing market. The car market is now stuck at 15,500,000 units a year in the United States, which is uh, down 2 million units a year from what it normally or normally is in good times, at least. Mm -hmm. um, so all of those things would be suggesting those are two huge parts of of uh, of where people spend their money. It looks like they're spending it on trips, <laughs> but that's that's where it's ending up. <laughs> yeah. So as so, what we're looking at now, I think uh, I think you and I talked about this last week. I said the market is maybe stretched too far. S and P had gone up. I think last Thursday or Friday had gone up thirty percent in like five months or something like that, or four months. It was like a record in terms of how fast the S&P had gone up uh, in a short period of time. And I was starting to say, you know, every time I see something that's out just way too far like that, you start to go, okay, when does the greed factor come in? And people start going, ah, let me take a little of my winnings and get those off the table and see if I can put them into something that's more depressed. So this week, we've had the S&P come down 3%. The Dow down 5% and the NASDAQ down 2% just in the last week. Um, is this the beginning of a 5% to 10% correction? Or is this 100% based on the news? I think generally the mood uh, among stock participants is very bullish, extremely bullish. Um, yeah, I'm seeing some FOMO as far as like my prospect meetings when I'm meeting with people who um you know, want my help on the investment side and i'm i'm talking more about like diversified people who are local to where i am which is in indiana uh -huh. um so i'm i'm seeing people kind of like get impatient with whatever style they're investing and you know want to add more nvidia to their portfolio <laughs> and things like that um yeah so i I wouldn't be surprised by that. Also, you know, what you're talking about with consumer confidence, um, inflation has been persistent. You know, I'm, I'm surprised people are as ebullient as before um, when there's been a lot of um, disappointment, especially the Fed, you know, yeah. disappointment when the Fed was going to start lowering cut. rates. <laughs> yeah, very big disappointment. <laughs> now we're down to maybe two cuts. A couple of people starting to say maybe no cuts, maybe a raise. Um, so that is a big change from five to six cuts. Mm -hmm. uh, the Fed saying three, but other people are going, oh yeah, probably five to six. How much? Let me ask you this. This is a crazy question. Maybe you have no opinion on it. You know, I was touting trueflation and talking about trueflation like every day. Next Tuesday, I've got a spaces with them at six thirty California time, and we're gonna. We're gonna come. We have a come to. We're gonna have a meeting because <laughs> mm -hmm. their numbers are just. They're, they're sitting at one point seven four right now for mm -hmm. their for their numbers. Um, I think a lot of people might have been looking at trueflation. The Fed mentioned trueflation at at least one time, maybe more than one time. They mentioned trueflation as something they were looking at. Mm -hmm. I think maybe that that I'm gonna, I'm going to ask them that question on Tuesday morning. Do you think there's a chance that enough corporations and enough business advisors and other people were looking at those numbers and going, you know, everything's looking great here. Um, and, uh, you know, then it, it wasn't really happening, at least based on the government's version. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a really big question. I, I hope to listen to your spaces on Tuesday and, and find out more. I think that would be a great question to ask them. Right. <laughs> Because they claim they have a lot of major, you know, corporations, you know, buying their stuff. So mm -hmm. <laughs> when I say well, buying, there's two I, levels of that, paying for would, it with money and then buying what they're saying. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would tend to trust what their what their research is showing. I, I'm guessing they're like scanning the expenses of consumers um, to see, you know, where the money is flowing out of their accounts on a monthly basis. Uh, that's how I would set up like some kind of tr true measure of inflation. Um, so, you know, there, there's a big discrepancy in what they're seeing versus what, um, 
what people are seeing as far as like consumer expectations and the consumer confidence and how persistent it's been with the Fed or with the the national numbers. They get a ton of data. There's no doubt about it. They are bringing in a massive amount of data and they'll show you, they tell you right where they're getting their data. So you're getting it for, you know, for rents and and home prices, they're Mm -hmm. getting Zillow and Redfin and, you know, uh, all these different uh, companies that put out the kind of data, uh, what they do with it once they get it. I don't know if they, how they, how they average it or, 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 cause I've seen, you know, in my uh, real estate, I've seen differences on Redfin compared to Zillow. Mm-hmm. Um, so they got to have some way of, of monitoring, figuring that part out. But uh, so they're getting a, a directly, they're getting data in from hotel chains and whatnot. So, I mean, they're getting, you know, some raw data, and then they have to figure out what to do with it. That's that becomes the interesting part. Um, but they they are clearly okay. CPI could be wrong. That's a possibility. Okay, but one of them's wrong. <laughs> well, one one good criticism I've heard this past week is that um, the the two biggest things that are keeping CPI higher are um, home or renters and transportation so shelter and transportation and um the fed keeping rates high i don't think that helps with shelter costs like you really need more supply of shelter yes. um and i think a chunk of that can be driven by local governments and in their approach to zoning and sure. and all that and the ability and willingness for builders to to make uh, new projects. Um, so, you know, what bearing does interest rates really play on that? Yes, and um, the same the same thing is true of on transportation. The big issue is uh, insurance, which is up twenty two percent per year. And the insurance fa- and financing, and they're they're making the financing <laughs> financing of cars worse by right. having high rates so like not going to uh, affect insurance it's not going to bring the cost of insurance down in order if you raise the rates so yeah i those those things don't seem to be affected i think that i'm agreeing with you 100 mm-hmm. <laughs> percent. now eating out that's the other big one that is really staying up there like four something percent and both that's one that trueflation and uh cpi agree on it's still sitting up around four percent on eating out and again, uh, will interest rate increases change people's eating out um, habits? Maybe a little, but it seems in the, maybe on the margin. But I don't know if I'm going to go to McDonald's or to In and Out. See, I'm in California, so I don't know if I'm going to go to In and Out less. <laughs> yeah, because interest rates are higher. Anyway, it's a very interesting overall situation. Uh, we'll, of course, continue to follow it closely. Now, you did have some breaking news also on CATL with regard to your whole mega pack. End of yeah, the- I think this was according to Electric, and I, I did hear this secondhand. I was doing a lot of driving today, but reportedly CATL is coming out with a mega pack competitor product. They already have one uh, or multiple versions of it. Um, BYD is also a competitor, LG, the, the battery makers also make their own large stationary storage. But what CATL is talking about is a, a, uh, a product that has twice as many batteries under one in one container as the mega pack. So it, essentially I think it would have to be the size of a semi trailer. It would be too big to be, uh, in a shipping container size. Uh, so it'd be eight close to eight megawatt hours of, of storage. The other piece from the news was they were saying their battery doesn't degrade uh, within the first five years. And uh, Jordan Kisugi commented on this news, speculating that um, you, can, you can dope a battery with more lithium to prevent that degradation, but that uh, adds more expense to the batteries. Right. Um, so interested to learn out more, learn more. But like CATL already had a um, a stationary storage solution, and you know we're seeing more trade friction between China and the U.S. And I, I'm not sure if there is more with China and Europe. Um, 
But the, like another question is, is whose software is going to go on these mega packs or these stationary storage? Yeah. When Tesla sells a mega pack in China, they probably won't be allowed to put their software on it. Um, and I'm, I'm curious about CATL, like, will they even be allowed to make them in the U S I'm guessing they won't get the $45 oh, <laughs> per no. kilowatt hour, uh, we'll get that. That's for sure. tax credit from the inflation reduction act. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. Yeah. And of course, you know, uh, Tesla and CATL have a fantastic relationship. Mm -hmm. Tesla and BYD have a fantastic relationship. Tesla and LG. I mean, they these guys are all buds. They're all doing business together already. Yeah. So it's a perfectly, it would be perfectly normal if there are issues with the software. You know, and if, if Tesla's obviously going to be building batteries in China, uh, CATL is helping them build batteries in Reno. They're actually providing them yeah. with with the equipment and the setup time or the setup help. Yeah, uh, essentially like it was a working factory in China and, and <laughs> CATL packaged it up for them, served them, served it to Tesla on a silver platter. Yeah. Um, so it's like uh, th there is a really good uh, working relationship there. So if Tesla is planning to sell, sell mega packs in China, made in China in their factory, uh, CATL, CATL already knows that. In fact, they might be supplying them with the batteries that are going to go into the into mm -hmm. the containers. So maybe CATL would also provide the software if, or maybe it would be a modified software that would not give the Chinese communists any worries about it being able to be used for some kind of espionage purposes. Yeah, yeah. All, I all think I think Tesla. You know, they are the largest purchaser of batteries, but I'm guessing they pay a good price yeah. for the batteries. And I, I think um, CATL may, may be better off selling them to Tesla before they deploy them themselves. But they'll, they probably also want some, some outlet when Tesla isn't buying as many or if that happens. Um, this could also be a bit of gamesmanship where they're saying, hey... You don't buy all our batteries, especially these new ones we're making in China or whatever. Uh, we're gonna sell a mega pack competitor. Right. Um, so, you know, it, I was, there could be more going on. Who knows? <laughs> you know, Bradford. Though I was saying this the other day uh, it, to somebody in the green room, so I haven't said this before on the program. When I was growing up in business, there was clear distribution levels. Manufacturers sold to distributors, distributors sold to dealers, dealers sold to consumers. And then all of a sudden, it's all completely gone. Manufacturers sell direct to consumers on Amazon. Manufacturers sell direct to dealers. Manufacturers are opening up their own dealerships if they think mm -hmm. that a dealership will work for them, like Tesla. <laughs> and yet those same manufacturers might be selling to retail and also still selling to wholesale and also selling mm -hmm. to other dealers, depending on the region, depending on what they're looking for in terms of uh, distribution in an area. So those barriers have completely broken down. And so I think it's not unusual that Tesla has these relationships with these suppliers, these three battery suppliers, and that they're all going to be kind of competing with each other at the same time as that they're buying and selling from one another. So it's kind of the it's kind of the new normal, and it's a it's interesting to have watched this in one lifetime, change so completely. <laughs> yeah. So I'd say the an, another important lesson from this is scale. It, you you want to have scale as a manufacturer, so. You know, having these deals with each other uh, allows each other to to have a, a a good amount of scale. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's uh, first of all, in the after hours, Tesla went up another. I'm sorry, went up fifty six cents. So it recovered some of its down three fifty five during the day, but it didn't get that much of a pop yet out of the ninety nine dollar news. We'll see what happens on Monday. But I'd love to go through some of these uh, other numbers with you mm -hmm. because. Right now, I think they're really, really important. I think we're really, first of all, we've got this huge Iran problem happening uh, over the next day or two. Uh, the president of the United States has talked about the fact that Iran is probably going to take some kind of action against Israel. Uh, we've moved the Eisenhower closer to the battlefield. 
Um, we've got the possibility that Hezbollah and others, the Houthis and, and some others might all be ganging up on Israel all at once. A lot of talk about what might be happening this weekend. And that's going to affect things like oil prices and whatnot. So let's just kind of take a quick look through here. Um, so you've got uh, the bond market was actually uh, down today, five and almost six basis points on the 10-year, which was a little surprising given all the rest of the news. But I think that could be one of those got it out a little too far. And people said, ah, you know, looks like a good deal to me. I'm going to buy some of that. So that's the only thing I can figure because there was no news in the going in the direction of good time to buy bonds. But apparently some people thought it was a good day for bonds. Thoughts? Not really. Okay. All right. <laughs> we got oil up uh, 43 cents on the day at 85.45. Brent went back over $90. Um, so that is indicative of what's happening in the Middle East, but it didn't jump up a huge amount. Um, but I was watching the um, All In show, the uh, you know the four billionaires that get together, and uh, and they were talking about the fact that you can watch that the OPEC Plus group and Russia have every time the U.S. increases production, they decrease production. So they seem to be shooting to try to keep it around ninety bucks. Maybe they even went a little higher, but right now it looks like there's this gamesmanship going on where the United States is increasing production and they're decreasing it, trying to keep these prices. Now, they went a little further in their analysis and said that maybe that same group wants to mess up the administration that's currently in power, and maybe they feel like they do better in a Trump administration. I don't know that I can make that argument that they think that Trump would be better for them. As a Trump supporter, I'm not sure that I, I can even make that that uh, uh, statement, but that was one of their conclusions. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, what I do know is when Trump was president, he did sign a major weapons deal to sell weapons to Saudi Arabia. As I think it's like a five some billion or something like that. Um, maybe it's more than that, but um, Trump can work with Saudi Arabia. That's clear. That's clear. So there might be <laughs> so the Saudis might certainly feel that way, and maybe maybe Russia feels like there would be a, a deal on uh, the Ukraine instead of the continued mess if uh, Trump was in office. I'm not sure, but anyway, but I, I would say based on your fact pattern, you're saying that Saudi Arabia is trying to keep a lid on oil prices. No, no, no. To keep it at 90 and not go up higher. Up. So no. it's keeping a lid on top. On the top. Yes. Not not so, a lot. So here. so Saudi Arabia is kind of pushing down prices. No, so no. That, no. Not a lid on top. No, no. Keeping them up at 90. Not, okay. not letting them. I thought you said down. Saudi Arabia was increasing. No, cutting. Supply. Cutting. I mean, every time. Cutting, cutting supply. Oh, okay. The U.S. increases. Yeah. Okay, Cut. that makes sense. Then I apologize. <laughs> yeah, they're down a they're down a million barrels a day under the OPEC agreement. The okay. Russians just cut another five hundred thousand under what they were doing, and they're trying to sell more of it to their own country. So it's just every every time the U.S. and the U.S. is producing more oil than they've ever mm. produced, and Canada is producing really well too. But these guys keep uh, cutting every time. It looks like they're trying to prop up. The price of oil. The canary in the coal mine. That's another story today. Another story today that copper is up another 1.48% today at $4.31. The all-time high on copper is about $4.75. So we wow. are now heading towards an all-time high. But there was a new aspect of the story today. And that is that why would there be all of a sudden a run on copper? What's happening? that Elon has been talking about for six months and the rest of the world has been talking about for two months, that's going to use up a bunch of copper. Data, centers, data centers. Yeah. All of the infrastructure, all the electricity that's going to be needed for data centers and for electric cars and electric ovens and electric everything, all are going to use copper. So this could mean that copper right now is not the canary in the coal mine. This might just be a 
specific situation that copper is responding to as people begin to future cast about the a big, 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 because there's really not an alternative. So um, per, perhaps it's a secular shift uh, relating to you know higher electricity usage and not a cyclical shift um, from people freaking out about inflation or uh, yeah. some other cyclical shift in the economy. You said that so much better than I did. That was a that was very <laughs> <laughs> then we've got the other cyclical shift, or is it a is it a secular shift? And that is gold. <laughs> well, it actually is going down 1250 now. In, so this is the first time I think I've seen well, okay, second time in like 10 days has been down $2,360 an ounce. And I continue to read the articles, and all of them seem to be pointing at China primarily. The China central bank. The Chinese consumers are buying gold hand over fist. A lot of other central banks are also buying gold. Um, maybe, maybe Americans are looking at gold as a storehouse, uh, you know, against inflation, against uh, any kind of other, you know, war and all those kinds of things that we're dealing with. But yeah, this is really wild. It's all time high by a lot now. So why do you think the Chinese consumer would be buying more gold? Is is the regime clamping down on cash or because um, like their economy isn't that great? Chinese are really great savers and they used to take all their savings and put it into these residential units, these, uh, you know, as um, uh, either a rental or as an as a vacation place or whatever mm -hmm. and rent them out. Uh, but of course, as you know, what happened to the to the residential business in yeah, China? The property market is really suffering. Yeah. Oh, laps completely. So now these people have been screamed. So I think they're probably looking. The Chinese consumer is probably looking for something that they know is not going to collapse in that same way. Now, when you run up the price of gold this much, it goes back to the not just Randy Kirk theory, but the over your skis theory of. How far can it really go between mm -hmm. some people before some people go, uh -huh, I'm going to cash in on this deal. Mm -hmm. I, th I think Warren Buffett popularized this thought about gold is like uh, gold doesn't create more gold. There's no yeah. dividend that comes from your gold. It doesn't reproduce. You can go over to your gold. You can shine it up. <laughs> you can talk to it if you want and maybe see your reflection, but um it's it's not a productive asset right 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 i mean it's a unlike silver it's not used in industry nearly as much but there is an, an industrial application for gold but no that's not why people have gold mm -hmm. Our, part of it is uh like my favorite bitcoin oh we didn't look at bitcoin part nope. of it's just because it's it's valuable because it's valuable uh let's let's go ahead and see what bitcoin did today so down <laughs> Down 3,500 to 668. Mm -hmm. So no longer pushing against 70 or slightly over 70. So that's a, a big 5% uh, uh, down today. Man, I love volatility. If, uh, but I, I can't get myself interested in buying some crypto and playing these bounces. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you uh, ever bought coin? I had some ETH, some Ethereum. Ethereum? Yeah. Oh, okay. No. But I, yep. Yeah, the the two, it broke my investment thesis. So I I thought other major corporations would adopt mm -hmm. Bitcoin after Tesla. I see. And beyond like Square going or now Block going deeper into Bitcoin. No one has. Right. Um, and no country bigger than El Salvador has adopted Bitcoin. Right. Um, and that was, I think, over two years ago. Right. So yeah, ad adoption of Bitcoin um, for for use for usage has not increased. And it's it's most ardent proponents don't use Bitcoin in transactions. So yeah. if it's it's supposed to be a currency, yeah. but we're not using it in transactions. Um, it doesn't really make much sense 
to me. I, I have trouble understanding it. if 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 fiat currency isn't the currency, but then all the Bitcoin people, when they buy goods and services, use fiat. They don't use Bitcoin. Um, that makes sense to me. <laughs> me too. We're on the same page. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Me, I've got a couple of books here. I'm supposed to read about it so that I, so that I become a, a better, so that I have a better understanding of what's going on. I think the blockchain point part of it also throws me because I'm having the hardest time truly understanding blockchain. It seems to make a lot of sense for things like contracts and, and uh, things of that nature, but I'm having a hard time understanding how it really, really in the final analysis protects me uh, in a currency. But I, I'll read those books someday and maybe I'll get smarter. I'm not sure. <laughs> Bradford, as always, I'm very thankful to have you come in and have us take a look at good news, whatever day it is. In this case, the good news today was FSD at $99 a month. Um, we'll see if that gives us a, another, another reason for seeing good news on Monday and if the stock uh, takes advantage of it. It, it also just seems like Tesla's a bit on a roll, just the positive surprises that we're getting. In fact, I was thinking the very thing, uh, I'm seeing like 20% or 80% drop in negative headlines because the reporters only have so much time. If you're giving them something positive to report on, they don't have as much time to report on the negative. So it's really dropped down in terms of negative headlines. Very, very nice to see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Enjoy your weekend, sir. And thanks again for coming on. And to all of you out there, it's been great talking to you.